All right. So um, just a quick thank you, everybody. Um, we just finished our membership season. Um, so if you've enjoyed programs from the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust in this past year and you haven't renewed your membership, um, please consider doing so. We, we really appreciate it and it makes our annual operations uh, possible. We do uh, more than 50, 60 um, free public programming. We do annual monitoring and stewardship of our conservation lands. Um, and we work closely with many community groups um, to bring you wonderful conservation land. So I just wanted to introduce Liz, our speaker tonight. She co-founded Biodiversity Works in 2011. Uh, which is a nonprofit based in Martha's Vineyard, and she's going to tell us some some great stuff about it. Um, and she's a, a wildlife biologist, and she has more than 20 years of experience working with a variety of animals. Um, and tonight we're going to hear about her work with spotted turtles. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the screen share and invite Liz to share your screen. And We'll get started. Okay, does that look good? Can you see it? See my slides? Yeah. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, great. All right, hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in tonight um, to learn about our research with spotted turtles. And um, I'll mark this week. Um, so, like Bryn said, my name is Liz Olson. I'm the assistant director and wildlife biologist at Biodiversity Works. Um, um, and so, just a little bit about Biodiversity Works. Uh, we're a nonprofit here on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off the coast of um, Cape Cod. And as you can see from this very busy slide, uh, we do a lot of different things here at Biodiversity Works. Um, our main focus is working with wildlife on the vineyard, studying them, um, doing research, monitoring, and um, monitoring their populations over time. Uh, so we do a lot of research with turtles, bats, snakes, um, and then also in the summer, we're uh, protecting and monitoring beach nesting birds. And then we mentor young people who are interested in the field of science. Um, and then more recently, that's sort of how we started out, was this tagline of uh, wildlife research, monitoring, and mentoring. Um, and then more recently, we've started two programs, um, the Ma Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life and then Natural Neighbors. And so Atlas of Life is um, recording all of the biodiversity work, biodiversity on Martha's Vineyard um, through different avenues like iNaturalist. And then Natural Neighbors, um, you can call our director, Richard, and um, he will come to your yard and tell you how to add biodiversity to your yard by either planting native plants or putting in water features or making a hybernacula, um, like this one is here, um, to add more biodiversity to your to your property. So lots of things happening um, at uh, Biodiversity Works, but today I'm going to talk to you all about spotted turtles. Um, so in case you haven't seen a spotted turtle, there are these beautiful little guys um, with little yellow dots on their shells. It almost looks like somebody painted um, these little dots on the shell, on the bats. Um, and you can sometimes confuse them with maybe box turtles. I mean, you can see here, it's a very blotchy yellow. Um, box turtles often have these great designs on the back, um, quite different, but maybe in a flash you would you would think it was a spotted turtle. Um, but box turtles also have that boxy tortoise shell. Um, and more, more so you can confuse it with um, a baby box turtle, uh, which ha does have these little dots, yellow dots on it, but again, has that boxy um, shell. I've never seen a baby box turtle. Um, and if you have, it's been amazing. <laughs> and hopefully you took lots of pictures. Um, for this presentation, I Googled like, baby box turtle and I was just like in awe of how adorable these little box turtles are. Um, and here in the vineyard a lot of people confuse spotted turtles with painted turtles um, probably because they see that yellow streaking on their neck but um, as you can see very clearly there aren't those little yellow dots so 
you're really looking for um, the little yellow dots on their carapace. So the top of a turtle shell is called carapace and the bottom is plastron. And so you can also see here for the painted turtle, they have that big like uh, dark orange um, coloring. Whereas a spotted turtle is gonna have this pinkish orange um, plastron and then these big black blotches. Uh, it, if you're in the field, you can easily tell male spotted turtles from female. So the males are gonna have a black chin and females are gonna have an orange or yellowish chin. Males also have brown eyes, females have orange eyes, but I feel like the chin is the easiest thing to tell them apart. Um, Male, males also have that concaved plastron um, so that they can mount the female during mating season. Um, so that's another easy way to tell the male and females from each other um, in the field. So spotted turtles can be found in a variety of habitat, um, but they really do like that sort of shrubby, um, swampy, bog type habitat. Um, they're not gonna be found and this is their big open, um, sorry, big open ponds. That's where you would find uh, painted turtles or snapping turtles. They really like this sort of dense vegetation and then maybe a little pool nearby. This is our prime, like what we found to be the prime spotted turtle habitat on the vineyard. Um, so this is all sweet pepper bush, poison ivy, um, and a kind of a swampy sphagnum moss with little channels in it um, that the turtles love. And I sort of say like, if it's impossible to get into then spotted turtles are probably living there. That's what we found here. So here's an up close look. So you can see like there's these little channels through the, through the uh, moss um, that they can hide in. And then often these, these wetlands will, um, will dry up. I just want to check. Um, and then here's just another example. Um, so this is a larger pool. We didn't really find them in this pool, but they like to be on the outskirt, <clears throat> outskirts of where all this vegetation is. And if you got in there, there'd be these little channels that they would hide up. So they also like to nest um, in these in these wetlands and they're very cryptic about it. Um, and we were very, very lucky to find this turtle nesting. It was definitely the highlight, probably one of the, the highlights of this study because we had tag turtles hoping to find them nesting, um, but never did. And you can see the poison ivy <laughs> reeds all around this. I mean, we would have never, it was really just lucky in, in so many respects that we found it. Um, so they like to, you know, be in like fields, meadows, or even just on the side of the wetland. You know, if you think about painted turtles and snapping turtles, like they're coming out after a big rainstorm, you often see them digging on the side of the road or, or not the road, but like a path or something like that. So these guys are very cryptic and you're not really going to see them out nesting. Actually, sometimes they'll nest at night um, and just kind of find a little spot in the, in the vegetation that they can lay their eggs. They only lay three to four eggs, so not as many eggs as some of our other turtles, um, which is partly why their populations um, could be in decline because they're just not producing as many new new hatchlings. But once they do find a spot and they lay their eggs, they usually hatch, um, they, they lay them around June and then hatch around August, September. And when those little hatchlings come out, so here's the little hatchling here, um, they will, they're more carnivorous, so they're eating lots of uh, worms and snails and amphibian larvae. Um, and then as they grow older, they do start eating some vegetation, but for the most part, they're uh, carnivorous turtles. And they can live um, 60 to 110 years. So they're a very long turtle, like most of our turtle species, um, but still pretty amazing. So sort of the life for a year in the life of a turtle, <laughs> a spotted turtle. Um, sorry, it's like I don't talk anymore. <laughs> I haven't used my vocal cords in a while. Um, so the life of a turtle, a spotted turtle, um, they're they like to be mostly active during the cooler months. Um, so during those hot months of July and August, they're actually 
um, going into the uplands and excavating. Um, and that's what these pictures are showing here. So this time of year, they're in their wetlands, in the mud, um, hunkered down for the winter. It's called brew mating. So it's kind of like hibernating. Um, and then in the springtime, they're actually one of the first turtles to emerge in the spring because they like that cooler weather. Um, and then they'll, you know, be finding mates and um, moving around, eating, fueling up. And then come in the summer, they'll be nesting, you know, in June. And then come those hotter months, their weapons are actually sort of drying up. A lot of a lot of their weapons will dry up unless it's been a very wet spring. So they'll move into the uplands um, to to cool off and, and hide out for the summertime. Um, and then once their wetlands have filled back up, they move back into the wetlands and move around in there. So this is this puts a lot of threats on them um, or makes them very vulnerable because they can be run over by lawnmowers, which is uh, what likely happened to this poor turtle. Um, you can see it clearly was hit either by a weed whacker or a lawnmower. Um, you know, if they're moving up into the uplands, they could be run over if there's roads nearby. Um, so it kind of puts these turtles that puts them makes them more vulnerable um, compared to spotted or uh, painted turtles and uh, snapping turtles who are staying in their wetlands the entire time. Um, of course, habitat loss and fragmentation are sort of a threat for all, all turtles um, and many wildlife. And then um, even climate change, because <clears throat> especially here on the vineyard, I'll show you a map later where, you know, one of the wetlands is right next to a salt marsh. And those salt marshes are getting inundated, and eventually, you know, this bog is going to disappear. Um, and then one that maybe you would think of, and is actually a significant threat for these these turtles, is pet trafficking. So um, collectors come and collect uh, spotted turtles. Box turtles are another one that are often collected and then sold to Asia for as pets. Um, so that's a significant. Uh, threat to these guys. So because populations are kind of on decline, um, starting in 2016, uh, the Spotted Turtle Working Group um, wanted us to do an assessment of the population and see where they were at throughout their entire breeding range. So from all the way from Maine, all the way down to Florida. And we kind of came late in the game, but we wanted to be part of this assessment as well. We wanted um, the vineyard populations to be part of this assessment. Um, and so that entire assessment is complete now, and now they're still deciding about the filing, but not the spotted turtles will be listed. They hadn't been listed because they are fairly abundant species, but with a lot of those threats that I mentioned, populations are declining. They wanted to check in and see how <clears throat> the population was doing as a whole. Um, so here's a, it's an old map. So I could find um, from Massachusetts. These are all the locations where um, spotted or counties where spotted turtles are located. I tried to figure out where you guys are. You probably know better than I do, but I was thinking it was kind of around here uh, is Lincoln. I could be wrong about that. Um, and maybe you guys can tell stories afterwards of spotted turtles, where you've seen spotted turtles, if you have. But um, it seems like you might have spotted turtles in here county. So <clears throat> the first thing we did is try to identify where we were going to trap um, and look for spotted turtles. So we decided to focus on uh, historical sites and then places where people had recently seen spotted turtles, like within the last 10 years. Um, so this guy, James Lazell, was the last person to do any assessment of spotted turtles on the vineyard, and that was in 1976. So we are well overdue to uh, do an assessment here. Um, and what he found was that, you know, populations seem to be fairly low, but he did locate um, select areas where there were populations. So we really targeted it on those spots and then also areas, like I said, where there had been some recent um, sightings. So my colleague had seen a, a spotted turtle during her PhD work up in here, um, and there was one seen here 20 years ago. So we kind of focused in um, on those areas. And we developed these uh, based on the, the protocols the, that the spotted turtle working group had developed. We had these refer reference plots. And within each reference plot, we would put traps. Um, 
And we started this work in 2020 and then just finished in 2022. So each reference plot would get five tracks. These are what the tracks look like. Um, they had little floaters in them so that uh, they would stay above the water. And then we went through lots and lots of sardines. We smelled really good all season. Um, and like I said, if it was hard to get to, then um, spotted turtles were probably there. So it took, you know, either trying to kayak to some of these areas or um, wading through poison ivy and lots of vegetation to try to get to the traps um, right where we hoped that spotted turtles would be. If we, when we caught spotted turtles, we would measure them, weigh them, take measurements, and then each turtle got a unique um, marking. So what we would do is uh, make a little notch in their scoops. Um, and so this turtle is number four, just a, as you're looking at it, but this is uh, like one through five here. And then on the back side would be 10 through 50. So, <clears throat> I think this turtle is actually number 14. So if you would look on the other side of it, you would see that the, the number 10 scoop was not. Um, so this is a great way to do mark recapture and look at populations over time. And um, that was the idea is that each turtle has an individual um, marking so that we can follow that in individual over time and do, a, and do a full population estimate. So then not really part of the protocols or the, the assessment was <clears throat> putting radio transmitters on these turtles because we were just curious for ourselves, you know, how these turtles were moving through their habitats. Um, we were hoping that, you know, if we put a transmitter on one turtle, it'll lead us to more turtles. Um, and, you know, just learning what the threats were to our population. We kind of know what the threats are to the population as a whole, but what are our turtles um, up against? So we ended up tagging 12 spotted turtles um, and we would track them one to three times per week, depending on the time of year. And then we would record, of course, their location, their behavior, you know, were they swimming, were they submerged, were they in the uplands estimating, were they, um, you know, hunker down for the winter, and then what habitat they were utilizing. And tracking was definitely an adventure um, because while their wetlands are very hard to get to, also when they move through the uplands, it can be a, a challenge. Um, so just here are some few photos from our tracking adventures. Um, you know, sometimes it was easy like this. Um, and then other times we were crawling through shrubs and um, brush poison ivy and ticks. So this is a little <coughs> tick bomb. I don't know if you guys have Lone Star Ticks in Lincoln where you get these little tick bombs, but um, in one of our populations, uh, they were all over the place. <laughs> um, so we would go in like full suits to, to track the turtle. Um, sometimes we had a kayak to track them because uh, that was the only way to access the habitat. Um, but I think for the most part, everyone enjoyed it and was always happy at the end. Um, this is my favorite photo, I think, of all the tracking. Here's poor Ingrid in the shrubbery, you know, covered head to toe with, um, covered up so that she doesn't get poison ivy or ticks um, and trying to navigate through to, to, te um, to uh, track these turtles. So what did we learn from all of this? Um, overall, we uh, surveyed 10 sites and we had 1,362 trap nights um, and only caught 24 spotted turtles, which is not a lot. So it was a lot of empty traps, um, but we did eventually identify three populations um, on the vineyard and probably there's a fourth one, um, but we don't, even though we trapped the site extensively and never caught any, we know that there are they are out there. Um, and at least two of these populations had varied age classes. So we did catch, you know, males, females, young, juvenile turtles and um, older tur turtles. So that's a good sign that those populations are, are persisting. So this is kind of the map we ended up with. So you can see the areas that we've tracked. <laughs> the red is where we didn't catch anything. Green is where we did catch stuff. So there's actually two populations over in here. Um, 
And this population uh, was a newbie for us. Um, so it wasn't a historic site, wasn't even on our radar. And um, somebody from the community, a caretaker up there, took a picture of a spotted turtle, posted it on Facebook, and then that picture was sent to us. And then we reached out to the, um, the caretaker and the landowners and said, sure, come on over and see what you can find. So we found this beautiful habitat and you know this great spotted turtle population. So that was a real win for this project. Um, these two populations were known and so we were able to get in there easily and, and monitor them. And this one is where we have, um, we trapped extensively um, and then a caretaker took a picture of a spotted turtle, like right where we had trapped. Um, so we know there's a population out here, we just have not found it yet. Um, and we're, I'm determined that we will at some point find that population. So there's at least four populations on the vineyard. Um, there could be more, but they're just so elusive and difficult to, to find that um, that's all we know at the moment. And so here's some results from our tracking. Um, these little blobs are their home ranges. And so the main take home is just how small their home ranges are, which kind of feeds into why it's so difficult to find them. Because you really have to be looking in that exact wetland, that exact spot that they're hanging out. Um, and so they're really, you know, clustered in these, in and around their actual wetland. Uh, this site was really great because we were able to tag uh, multiple spotted turtles, male and female. Um, so this purple blob here is a male. So you can see they didn't really travel too far out from their wetland. Their wetland is like right here. Um, and you can see here is the marsh in the background. So this is a site that is really vulnerable to climate change because this could all be inundated at some point and this population will blink out. Um, and so when we only have four populations on the island, you can imagine how, um, how concerning that is for, for this population. But again, you can see they're, they're not really moving that far. Um, the, these movements out here, just the turtles moving into the upland during the um, summertime, this one would kind of dry up. Um, there's a big pool in the middle that wouldn't dry up. But again, like I said, they don't like the bigger pools, so they'd rather be up in the uplands where they feel safer and can hunker down. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of them moved out into this marsh area, um, which was kind of unusual, but they were up further in the marsh. So I think not really getting any of that saltwater inundation um, during high tide. Um, and I imagine it's a nice, cool, uh, muddy place to hang out in the, in the hot summer. But this is also a good example where, you know, we have this data now and we can give this to the landowner um, or the conservation group and, and share with them, you know, management ideas. So, um, you know, even you can see where they've come up into the uplands here, you know, maybe not mowing those areas um, when, during the summer because spotted turtles could be up there, you know, depending on what their mowing routine is you know, we can really kind of get some information on uh, reducing threats for these, these turtles. So I just wanted to share a couple fun stories from our, um, from our tracking. Um, this is uh, T-Rex. So first is T-Rex um, got its name because uh, I, it was one of the earlier turtles that captured and there was a school group walking by and said, hey guys, I, I caught a turtle. Um, what should we name it? We gave all our turtles names because um, we caught so few and <laughs> it's fun for, um, and so the kid, one kid said poop. And I was like, mm, I think we'll have to pick a different name than poop. Um, and then another kid was like, rainbow brontosaurus. I'm like, yeah, maybe something a little shorter. Um, and finally, one of the kids said T-Rex. So I was like, all right, that's a winner. We'll, we'll go with T-Rex. So here's T-Rex, she's a female. Um, older female. She had a pretty worn shell. Um, and she took, uh, I can take you back here. So you can see this is T-Rex, this green. Um, so she spent a lot of time, of course, in her wetland, you know, the main wetland, but also moved out into the marsh area. And then a few, um, few points up here uh, in the uplands. And she was one of the only um, turtles where we thought she was going to lead us to a um, nesting site, but she did not, or, or we missed it. She was 
secretive about it. But anyways, um, she always liked to come back to the, um, the wetland and hide in this one area. And so my colleague Silas was always kind of coming back to the same area, could never find exactly where she was. Um, and so one day he had some extra time on his hands and decided, all right, I'm gonna like go in there and figure out where this little hidey hole is. And he doesn't get poison ivy, so he could go down in there and dig around. And so he did find her, there he was. But then he also found out that he does get poison ivy. So it was a bummer end for him. <laughs> he did find it, um, but got a lot of poison ivy. So you can see these are all poison ivy roots, um, which we know are is, is an easy way to get poison ivy. Um, and then up here, he's just showing like that uh, T-Rex like to hang out in the marsh. Um, and that's kind of what the habitat looks like. And then she could, she had to go out with a band. So um, I was on maternity leave and um, I had given instructions to take uh, her transmitter off about two weeks prior to, or a week prior to um, the battery dying because we don't, we don't want, we want to make sure that we take these off before the, um, the batteries die so the turtle's not stuck with a transmitter. Well, unfortunately, this um, battery decided to die two weeks prior to um, the time that we were going to take it off. And usually these batteries last like beyond the point that they say, um, but this one decided to die two weeks prior. So um, we decided, all right, well, these guys don't move very far, so we'll put uh, traps out you know, where T-Rex was last seen. So Silas hung out and put a bunch of traps out around where uh, T-Rex was usually hanging out. And two days later, um, he caught her and removed the transmitter and off she went. So we were all very relieved um, that T-Rex was on her way and <laughs> with no transmitter. So she gave us lots of stories to tell. And this one is fun. Um, so my colleague was out doing salt marsh bird surveys and she looked down and there was a spotted turtle, um, which was kind of random. And so out here is where that turtle was found. And there is a population like further down this way. So it's possible it got washed out. Um, really not sure what happened, but anyways, of course we put a transmitter on it and it led us back to this wetland here. Um, but the bummer was that we had an epoxy issue. So we put the transmitters on with epoxy and the um, transmitter ended up coming off. So we didn't really get to get the full story of where this turtle ended up. I did um, trap this site uh, the next year and didn't catch any spotted turtles. So we don't think that this site is actually, you know, has a population of spotted turtles. I think Wilson was just, um, and so this is Wilson off of, off of um, Castaway, the, um, the friend Tom Hanks's um, I forget, a volleyball, I think it was. Um, that's where we came up with Wilson because he was sort of a castaway. We don't know where his home was. Um, and so he probably made it back there, but uh, we didn't get to follow him, which is a bummer. So just conclusions of this, um, all this work we've been doing, uh, we, we'd identified these three to four populations and they're all fairly low, but persisting. And this is not consistent with the mainland and Nantucket. Um, there are places on the mainland and Nantucket with really robust populations of spotted turtles. So it just seems on the vineyard, we don't have those robust populations. And maybe that was just the way it always has been. Um, you know, when Lozell did his work, he didn't find a lot of uh, spotted turtles here. And it could just be that we don't have the habitat. Um, it's hard to say why we don't have um, these robust populations, but it's probably habitat based um, where we just don't have a lot of those lands that they prefer. But of course, over time, development and roads and fragmentation, I'm sure that our populations have declined. And so, in doing this assessment, we can continue to monitor those populations over time. Now that they're tagged, we can do those mark recaptures and um, see if we're catching the same individuals. Um, so we've, we've kind of laid the baseline work and now we can maintain that um, into the future. Um, and the only way we're really gonna find more populations on the vineyard is if people report them. So we've done a lot of work 
uh, promoting that we want sightings. Um, this is the, the post of the, the guy who found that spotted turtle in the new population that we found. Um, and so something like that is what, you know, then we can go check out that area or put a transmitter on that turtle to keep it uh, or hold on to it. And then um, we can maybe find some more populations here. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Liz. That was wonderful. I, I love your stories. I imagine you, you spend a lot of time out in the field and have lots of experiences uh, bushwhacking your yeah. way through the through the marshes. Um, so I'm going to let people unmute themselves so folks are welcome to um, raise their hands and we can call on you to ask a question. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to do that, I've got a couple in the chat um, from Michelle. Are there gender differences in how far spotted turtles roam? Yeah, so males are definitely going to not roam as far. Females um, will will roam the farthest to to lay you know to lay eggs and uh, uh, well yeah just mostly for nesting. But males will like if the population is. Um, you know, it's getting crowded, they'll move on to another wetland. So they'll, uh, they could make some big movements, but the females are the ones that are moving more. Okay. And just to follow up to that, you may have mentioned it in your, at the beginning of your presentation, are they nesting in more upland areas or is it in, in the wetlands? They're not, I think they're mostly nesting within the wetlands, yeah. Okay. They can, they can move into the uplands and um, nest like in the fields and uh, like, you know, if there's a field or a meadow nearby or something like that. But I think that they're mostly nesting within, within the wetlands. Okay. Do we know why? Because the spotted turtles, they, I mean, sorry, not the spotted, I'm so sorry. The snapping turtles. <laughs> Uh, come out of the right. I mean, they, yeah. they the turtles that nest in my yard. They come out of right. the pond to mm -hmm. go to the upland to nest. So it's interesting that some do and some don't. Do you know? Do you know why? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I mean, my guess would just be that they are these like cryptic little turtles, and so it's just sort of their personality to find you know a little hidey hole to do it. Um, you know. I painted turtles and snapping turtles are very, I mean, of course, snapping turtle, they're a big turtle. Um, and so they're obviously going to need more area to, to nest in and painted turtles too. I mean, they're, they're probably like a quarter of the size more than a spotted turtle. So these guys are small enough that they can just kind of find these little spots to nest. Hmm. That's great. Uh, Peter? Yes, I'm wondering if they can live in brackish water because um, we have so many ponds on the vineyards, um, which are, you know, kind of a mix. Not much salt water gets in so they can freeze pretty well in the winter. Uh, or do they, does it have to be all, all fresh water? Yeah, these guys really like fresh water. Um, they're very much a freshwater turtle. I, I, yeah, I know what you mean, like the head of the coves, there, um, there's painted turtles up there and snapping turtles up there, but um, it's not very uh, spotted turtley like habitat. Hmm. Uh, Gwen? Um, do spotted turtles sort of bask in the sun the way, you know, painted turtles just line up on a log and in the sun, do, do spotted turtles do that? Yep, yeah, they do. Um, more on the vegetation, not so much um, out in the open. But yeah, yep, they'll get out and bask. And they don't really like the, the hot, hot sun. So um, they'll do it for a little bit and then dip down. But not, you won't see them like um, the painted turtles all lined up. Maybe in a group of them, there'll be one <laughs> um, right. hanging out. But yeah, yeah, I think, you know, when you think of spotted turtles, think cryptic, you know. They're very, uh, yeah, they're very cryptic little guys. Uh, At least Bob the ones had on a, the oh, Sorry. Uh, Bob had a question. Um, do you know what their natural predators are? What are what are they most vulnerable to? 
Um, certainly skunks, raccoons eating their eggs, um, and even actually eating hatchlings. So we had to be really careful. Um, if we had a raccoon get into one of our traps, we had to pull the trap because we didn't want to actually like catch a spotted turtle and then have a raccoon get it. Um, yeah, that would probably be the natural predators, yeah. Interesting. So you estimated that there were about four populations. Do you have any sense um, just based on your surveys of like how many spotted turtles there are in each of those populations, or is it just impossible to estimate? Yeah, good question. So we, we couldn't really do an estimate um, at these sites because we just weren't catching that many. Um, one of the sites we caught eight turtles, if my brain is um, remembering correctly, and we got a lot of recaptures at that site. So I think that population is fairly small. I mean, there may be more than eight turtles, but not much more. Um, mm -hmm. The other site was just so difficult to uh, to trap. Like we couldn't walk in there and, and really get. Um, get in good locations to actually catch turtles so like we only caught i think four or five individuals uh but there's probably more so yeah it's just i think if we did it again you know we could kind of do that mark recapture estimate um and that was kind of the idea is that we would trap you know one year and then trap again but we just weren't getting um the numbers to really do that full assessment uh, so all we can kind of do is the the last population is definitely a very robust population. We found juveniles, and, um, and that one I think we got thirteen individuals, which is still really small, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. This bigger one, so um, yeah. All we can really conclude is that you know when we compare our study to those like in Nantucket, or I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they just you know every time they go out, they're catching spotted turtles. Where it's like we would go out for days and maybe catch one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of all we can kind of yeah. conclude is that our populations are low. Yeah. Michelle? Yeah. Um, I'm sort of struck by like how they have these little microclimates and yet their, their range is so long from Maine to um, Florida. And... Um, and I'm sorry, excuse, pardon my ignorance, but I, I assume because the range is so wide that they're sort of like generalist species in a way. They're not like hyper special, even though they live in these like little microclimates, they're not mm -hmm. hyper specialized, right? Like right. it's not like yeah. they exist in a 30 mile or whatever, you know, some teeny tiny radius and have a highly specialized little ecosystem around yeah. them. Yeah. Um, and I guess that should give us hope for their survival or against yeah, climate yeah no I mean they're at, they're a fairly abundant turtle and I think it's just all the things that are affecting wildlife you know um habitat loss uh fragmentation climate change like all these things are you know affecting these turtles as well so it, the assessment was to look like do we need to let, list the species or not and there's definitely places where they're doing really well and there are places obviously that they're not doing um, great pollution is another, you know, threat to them. But yeah, overall, you know, not on Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> overall, they're fairly abundant species. Um, and yeah, they're they're generalists. So they like actually really like um, cranberry bogs, and um, you know, they can be in a variety of habitat, which is is good, a benefit to them for sure. And just to follow up on that, um, are there specific sort of I don't know, wildlife management um, approaches we might take to stewardship and land management um, in the instances where, I don't know, even even at, like in, in this example in Martha's Vineyard where climate change may be um, eliminating their habitat. I mean, are there, are there prescriptions that you might have for uh, how we might help species that are being threatened by climate change in a, in a, in a local environment. Yeah. I mean, I think for, for everything, you know, it's protecting land and keeping it open and, um, 
free from development, you know, so things can move um, and not, you know, putting, I mean, on a, on a small level, right, if you have a wetland, you know, for all turtles really is not putting a trail right next to the wetland because that's a corridor for predators, you know, every, everything likes the, uh, a trail to, to walk along and then the turtles like to nest there. Um, so they're just, easy pickings their eggs are easy pickings um but yeah i mean you know when we think about the the uh the population that's right next to the salt marsh you know that's a tough one because there is no wetland behind that um and the the marsh is right there so it's it's an easy sort of salt in, inundation um not a lot we can do there but i think preserving the populations that aren't like that um, are going to be even more important. Um, so having that, you know, conservation land nearby, ways that um, that things can shift, you know, but if they just hit up a, a block of development, nothing can happen. You know, there's no shifting there. It's just gone. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier too, I think about mowing, more upland areas that are close to the to their habitat because they might have gone up there during the summer. Yeah, yeah. Is that so correct? That's a great one for guys because people don't really think of turtles being in the uplands. I mean, they have very strict regulations for box turtles. They know a lot about you know when box turtles are nesting and moving and if they're going to do any um, any sort of mowing. They have set times where people can mow and stuff like that. And and this place may do that, but how does that line up with um, spotted turtles? I, I think actually it, it doesn't line up. Um, I don't know a ton about the management for box turtles, but I feel like it's like in the winter, you know, when they're um, hunkered down for the winter. And so, yeah, people are doing a lot of their mowing regimes in the summer because they're like, okay, oh, like, we're good. Um, so if we know that spotted turtles are in that area, we can say, hey, like maybe don't you know, mow this area. So it's a great, like easy management thing that we can suggest for the species. Mm -hmm. Karen? Oh, you're muted, Karen. Uh, when, you you say, when you say, is that okay? Is that working? Yeah. When you say that they're laying the eggs in the swamp as opposed to the uplands uh, in the marsh, uh, I assume you mean they're dry areas because they're obviously not laying them underwater. Is there a flooding issue? With I mean, uh, there could be, um, but by June, not really. Um, no, yeah, I mean, most of these wetlands are drying out by by that time, I think that's what they're banking on. I mean, yeah, I, I suppose if we had like a really wet uh, June, July, but I don't know, I, probably the same for you guys. I feel like July and August are pretty dry <laughs> here. So okay. these wetlands, are, you know, getting dried up and their eggs are safe. Um, the other question we had is, uh, I've heard bog turtles are similar, small, freshwater. Yeah, that yeah. Area. We don't have them here, um, oh. so I did I did read that briefly that they are similar. I looked them up. Um, they have like a yellow patch on their neck, but that's about it. So it's really the the yellow dots on the um, the back of the turtles. Well, uh, the the thing I wanted to ask is I'd heard that the bog turtles were scarcer in some sense, and I wondered if there was a reason why. Uh, they're also um, on the cape, but. Um, there was a habitat issue or difference in what they ate or something. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about <clears throat> bog turtles, unfortunately, because um, we don't have them here. But um, if they like bogs, then <laughs> bogs are sort of a, <laughs> a declining habitat, so that, that could be part of it. Um, and like, I don't know their their natural history, but like landing turtles, I know are um, they make these huge movements. Um, and so if bog turtles are similar, like landing turtles end up go crossing a lot of roads and getting run over. Um, right. So that's a, a threat to them. So if bog turtles are similar, you know, searching for other wetlands, then that could be a big threat to them as well. But so the, but you said the, spot, the spotted turtles were moving, just not a lot. So yeah, they don't move as far. Yeah. Yeah. They have very small home ranges. So 
um, you know, depending where their wetland is, like in general, road mortality is a threat to to all, a lot of turtles, um, reptiles, amphibians. Um, but for us, that's not, for our populations, it's not a huge concern. There's one site where there's a road nearby. Um, but on the mainland, I would imagine that's a, a threat for a lot of populations. Do you, do you know if they're nesting in simply, um, sorry, Wellfleet was running a long-term study on diamondback terrapins. Mm -hmm. And the diamondbacks were nesting in the same location, apparently for hundreds of years, but gradually mm -hmm. people built their tennis courts. This was becoming a problem. But um, they were marking the nests. And it sounds mm -hmm. like you found enough nests to mark, maybe, but did you have the impression they were nesting in the same general locations that you could protect? Um, that was our goal. That's what we, we had hoped, that we would track a female turtle to her nest and we would protect it. Um, but it's just really hard. Um, they, I could be wrong about this. I mean, if you guys haven't seen a diamondback or terrapin, they are so adorable. <laughs> what? We were out. Uh, we were out at Wellfleet and got to like um, put the hatchlings back. I think for the terrapins, I believe they kind of track them through the sand because it's all like they're nesting in the same area and they can track where the females have laid the eggs um, and it's pretty obvious. So they put these little cages around the terrapin nest. Um, and that's what we kind of had hoped with spotted turtles, but it's really challenging. I went out with um, a, a researcher on the Cape and he actually, um, when the turtle was close to, um, thought it would lay eggs soon, he attached a little thing of yarn on, I'm trying to remember now, on the back of its shell, and then maybe onto its tail or something like that. So when it was moving, the yarn was coming out, you know, the, or the thread. It was just like a little piece of thread. And that's how he was finding the nest. Um, and he even had trouble finding these nests. So the, the turtles were making these like big movements through, and then sometimes the thread would get cut. Um, but he did yeah. find some nests, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's really challenging for these guys to, to find them and then protect them. Um, your numbers look like you had a lot more females than males. With the diamondbacks, that was just because the females were the ones coming to land, and those were the mm -hmm. ones they were marking. The, the males were there somewhere. They saw them in the water occasionally. Mm -hmm. But you did you actually get that much more, that many more females? Did you have any explanation for why? Are there actually more in the population? Uh, possibly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know because we just didn't catch that many. Um, but yeah, you would think... Um, you think the males would be moving around a bit more to look for females, like within the within the wetland? Um, that's a really good question. I haven't really like thought too deeply about our sex ratio, but I will now. We did catch a lot of females. <laughs> Interesting. We got a question from the chat here, diverging a little bit from turtles, but you mentioned that. Um, Biodiversity Works will go out to people's properties and give suggestions and mentor on how they can Im improve their biodiversity. And one question is, how do you create a hibernacula in your yard? What do you know? Could you like 30 second elevator yeah. pitch on what goes into um, that? Yeah, I can, I can send you the plans to, um, yeah. Um, Brent, I can send it to you. And I don't know if you've got the mailing group or something. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll send the recording yeah, just for everybody on the call, I'll send this recording out um, uh, at the end of the week. And yeah, if you if you include that, I can send it out to everybody. Yeah, That'd just be great. to be clear, that's a snake hibernacula. Um, and yeah, basically you just dig a hole. Um, it has to be five feet deep. Um, and then you fill it with rubble. Um, so rocks, um, logs. We've, we've done two two um on trustees property out here um it was a great success we were we were focusing on black racers and they are they at least investigated it we don't know if they're actually using it we're going to increase our monitoring um in the spring and see if they overwintered but and then you're yeah so you're just sort of digging this hole um putting drain pipes in it and then filling it up with rubble um and then putting like sort of bigger debris over the top of it. Um, 
the, I think the hardest part is digging a hole. <laughs> um, so if you have a, a friend with an excavator or like just a little bobcat, we use the little bobcat. Um, I have great videos and stuff like that. If, if somebody's really interested to see the, the whole process, they can email me. Um, but yeah, it, it's a great way to, if you want to do something simple in your backyard, just put down cover boards for snakes, just a piece of plywood. Um, and it's fun to check them and see if, you know, snakes are using them. Um, and if you have the right habitat, like hibernacula is great. And, you know, even you guys can think about that for the land you own, um, your, for the land trust. I mean, that would be a great probably addition. I'm sure you guys have lots of snakes on your property. So, uh, happy to share those. Points. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. What, I, I don't really know where, what their habitat naturally is, black racers. Where would you find them just in the wild? Like, where would they find that nesting opportunity? Yeah, they're more um, like sampling grassland, which you guys probably don't have. <laughs> um, meadows, fields. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have a sense of like what snakes utilize your properties? No, but that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. Um, got a question from John here. Could you talk a little bit about the mechanics of the trapping, like how often you check them and if you've had any um, unintended guests in them? <laughs> oh, yeah, and, sorry. And then what, yeah, what inspired you or drew you to this work? Um, yeah, so they're just like little minnow traps. Um, when you're trapping like snapping turtles or even painted turtles, you use like big hoop traps. So this was great. We had done work with painted and snapping turtles and so, or actually painted turtles. Um, so it's nice to kind of exclude the snapping turtle because they're very difficult to, to get out of traps. Um, so they're just these like kind of little minnow type traps. And then we put sardines, we tie it to some vegetation or a tree. Um, and then there has to be some sort of floating device so that um, if, you know, there's a big rainstorm, the, the trap won't get sunk. Or if, you know, some, as long, you have to make sure there's an air bubble there for the turtles. Um, just in case something happens. And then we check the, we check them daily. Uh, we set them out for four nights and we check them daily um, because actually set, um, spotted turtles are, can get out of the traps. <laughs> so they, um, they'll, you know, if they're in there too long, they'll, they'll sneak their way out. So we would check them daily. Um, and that was basically it. Um, oh, and yeah, we got lots of, lots of other things that weren't spotted turtles. So, um, tadpoles and frogs and painted turtles and baby snapping turtle which those guys are fun um let me think if there was anything super fun um some fish but i think that was it nothing um uh, nothing too surprising but yeah a lot of times the the traps were filled with lots of things that not filled but um had things in it that we were not not spotted turtles sometimes we get little baby spotted turtles so that was fun and then what was the, was there another question? Oh, what, what drew you to this work or inspired you to continue doing it? Oh, good question. Um, I just always loved um, animals, I guess, when I was younger. And, um, and then, you know, I kind of opened up the big book for college. You know, back then there was a big book. <laughs> and um, I saw wildlife management. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, so I went to the University of New Hampshire. And then um, somebody who lived in my dorm uh, was going to do some sal salamander work up in uh, Bartlett, New Hampshire, up near Conway. And so I went up and did, I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. And then that's when I really kind of fell in love with like research, and asking questions and studying wildlife. Um, and that kind of, I went to, to Kenya um, and was like, oh, I'm going to go to Africa and solve all the wild human wildlife problems but um that path was harder to go down and uh, i did a little stint in hawaii but just always been drawn to uh, you know researching wildlife asking questions learning about them it's just all very exciting um and then there's that conservation piece of um you know collecting this information so that we can preserve these species kind of drives me that's great yeah, it's always really, really nice to kind of hear what, you know, keeps you going 
out in the after, after a long <laughs> field day you know what what's yeah. what's made it worth it yeah <laughs> Um, it's so always we have, like that moment you know like we say yeah. it's just like that moment you catch the spotted turtle or you find a new population that's just like it's worth a million dollars to have that all that hard hard work sweat tears <laughs> um yeah to to find that little piece of information that solves the not solves the puzzle but adds more information to the puzzle is it's worth it mm -hmm. Uh, we've got just a couple minutes left. So any last questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, we did have a comment early on from Norm, who I don't know if he's still on the call, but he says he has seen or heard of a spotted turtle population in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else on the call has seen one in Lincoln or heard of one, um, but feel free to share if you have. Um, well, and then, what they look like so you can yeah <laughs> it's interesting do you know what causes that coloration i don't know if you have like oh, no. technical <laughs> knowledge about about like I shell know. <laughs> coloration but it's it's very beautiful it is very beautiful do you guys have wetlands on your on your properties we do, and the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust has a, a wonderful bog property oh. that's unfortunately quite grown in with buckthorn now, oh. um, but it used to have, um, you know, harbor a lot of these sort of rare bog species, oh. so it's possible that that's, that's where um, yeah. Norm had seen this spotted turtle. Yeah. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, any last questions, folks? Ah, I see. Yeah, Norm yeah. Norm wants to keep fair it yeah. keep it out of that's yeah. that's very Norm. fair. It's but bad. it's around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is interesting what you said about trails going through those areas and and you know potentially having a negative impact on the wildlife because that is something that we think about trying to balance you know public access and uh you know enjoyment of the natural spaces and also making sure that the land and the habitat that we're protecting is actually you know serving its purpose for the wildlife that's living there um so yeah. that's an interesting um, thing to think about. And if you have any resources to share about, you know, finding that balance, I think that would be a very interesting topic to pursue further. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a or even, or even any studies that uh, demonstrate what you said, where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, the wetlands are coming yeah. up and, and, and uh, nesting right mm -hmm. there, where there's a trail and then the, the predators coming right down the trail. Um, yeah, no, there, mm -hmm. yeah, lots of studies out there. So. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, one last question, and then I think we'll we'll wrap up. Um, Norm just asked, do you think there's some uh, genetic diversity constraints because these turtles are are not traveling very far? Yeah, and they're so isolated. Like these populations are so isolated. Um, yeah, we you know, we collected genetics for these populations, and we're still. Um, which reminds me, I need to follow up on that. We never really got the results from that, but yeah, I would imagine that um, there's they're very they're almost maybe like distinct little populations. Mm -hmm. well, that'd be interesting. Hopefully, you'll you'll have a follow up next year. Yeah, <laughs> genetic <laughs> diversity. Um, well, thank you, Liz. This was really interesting. It was yeah, great to you. hear about. The work that you're doing on Martha's Vineyard, um, really interesting just to kind of hear the nitty gritty of how this type of research gets done. Um, and, you know, we just see the map at the end <laughs> showing the four, <laughs> four blue okay. circles, but it's a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, thank you. Well, thank and you thank, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and have a great rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you.